All right, so things going. Progress on PA4. Cool. Questions? Yeah. So, so try some trees that are pretty clearly balanced, like that one, right? Or a single node, or a completely empty tree. Those should all be balanced. Um, once they start getting bigger, chances are they're never going to be balanced. Okay. Okay, but if you just make a few nodes, right, like this should be balanced. If you add another node here or another node here or both, that's still balanced. But then if you start getting a little too heavy on one side or the other, that should be unbalanced. But, but try, try with, you know, just a couple of levels and that those should be balanced. And the easiest way to build those is, is make your plate something like, you know, dog, cat, elephant. And that should that should build a tree like that. But yeah, in general, once you start throwing nodes onto trees, chances are it's going to be pretty unbalanced. Yeah. So I have my add function working. I'm just not sure that's adding everything in the correct place. It's just like, how do we know if everything's being put in the right place? So you should always be adding to a leaf. Okay. So so you know, do your dog and your cat and your elephant, your tree should end up like that. Okay, now add an ant, it should go to the left of the D, left of the C, should come down right there. Okay, now if you add a bat, it should come down there, come down there, smaller than that, it should come out here. Okay, and if you have something bigger than C and smaller than D, it would come down here, it would end up right, right there. So, you know, pick some, some license plates with either numbers or, you know, simple words that you can alphabetize um, and draw a picture. And then do your traversals. Okay, so, so if your tree looks like this and you do it in order, it should be A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so left node right will always be alphabetical. That's the first test to know if something's going wrong. Because if, if it's not building it correctly, chances are it'll be unalphabetized. Um, but then this one, you know, you could do node left, right, and node will be D, C, A, B, E, right? And you can use a sample code um, on the server, put in that whole database, and then look at the three traversal orders that come out from the sample code compared to what you're getting. Um, and you can be tactical about this. So this, this is where Unix will be your friend. All right, so I do my star dump. Well, you know, I got tons of output there, okay? Um, go ahead and run your command, but um, redirect it into, you know, your good output. Do your star dump, do your exit. Now if I look at my good file, right, tells me my height's 21, the tree's not balanced, there's the NLR traversal, there's the NLR, sorry, LNR, there's the NLR, and there's the LRN. Okay, now run your code. And put that into another file. Call it mine. All right, there's my output. So there's a difference command, difference good mine, that'll tell you if there's any differences. So if I ran mine and the only difference was that these two entries got swapped, now when I do the difference, it'll tell me there was, there was some difference right there. And you can go into your file and figure out where that is and start. If they're the same, it won't show anything. It's only showing differences. So that's kind of like a final acid test, right? If you're putting exactly the same output as the test program, um, that, that tells you that things are good.
but you know if if you don't have exactly the same output and you don't have to have exactly the same output to get full credit right but if I use uppercase name instead of lowercase name and I do my difference it's gonna find zillions of differences okay which are bogus so use your VI skills and go in and you know change your name to match the desired output or change your code or get rid of name and just just use the license plates or something right it's it's um, it's Unix so you can do almost anything you like um, and it's not unusual to go through a bunch of gymnastics just to like validate your code like make a new version that just outputs the license plate or something All right, other questions? Yeah. For LNR? Yeah. Okay. Um, on the algorithm or on what it means or how to code it or all of the above? Okay. Um, coding LNR, I can tell you about. First, you got to check your edge case. Make sure root's not null. Okay, so if root is null, just return. So write a C statement for that. Okay, otherwise we recursively traverse our tree using LNR. So it's three statements. LNR root arrow left. And then print root arrow data and then LNR root arrow right so these you know are verbatim this is you know a printf statement print out the root arrow plate root arrow first root arrow last with percent s's and whatever format you want it to appear in that's all there is to LNR Make sure it's not null if it is returned. Otherwise, call LNR on the left subtree, print the root nodes data, and then call NR on the right subtree. And that should spin out a whole traversal. Okay. Yeah, we're going to. I brought my magic worksheets with me. So we will do that next. Other questions first? So does that keep going left if there's more branches to the left? Mm -hmm. And then go back to that. It basically... So it starts off by going as far to the left as possible, prints out that node. Then it will pop up one level, print out the root. Then it will go to the right and repeat. It will go as far to the left as possible, print that out, print the root, and then go to the right and repeat the process. Go as far to the left as possible, pop up, do the root, go to the right, and then pop up and do that root. And then pop up, pop, pop back to here, do the root, Nothing it can do on the right. Pop back up here, do the root. Now go over here, try to go to the left, do the root. Come down here, repeat the process. Go as far to the left as possible, do the root. Go to the right, pop, pop, pop. Comes back to null, it's done. Yeah? Balance, for finding the balance? Yeah. No, balance you can do entirely recursively. You could do it like that, but it's hard. Okay, balance we can do with, I think, a four-line definition. Okay, if the tree is null, return balanced. Also just if statements? Just four if statements, yeah. Okay. If, it's, if it's empty, it's balanced. 
Um, if the difference in the heights of the left and right subtree is bigger than one, it's not balanced. If the left subtree is unbalanced, it's not balanced. If the right subtree is not balanced, it's unbalanced. Otherwise, it's balanced. <laughs> All right, so it's really just four conditions you check. And that effectively does this. It effectively goes through and, and checks that balance definition at every point, and it trickles back up. All right, other questions? These are good questions. All right, let's talk about what goes on in the brain of a computer when you do a function call. We know that the address of the next instruction after the call has to be saved somewhere. So that when the called program eventually says return, you go back to the following instruction and you continue executing. So when you say call my print function, right, the address of the next instruction after my print instruction is saved on the stack. Okay, we use the stack because it's got lots of storage and if we have multiple calls, when we say, what's the last thing we put on the stack, it'll be the last return address that was saved. That's where we jump back to. But it turns out the stack's used for more than just the return address. Because every time we call a function, we want to make sure that our local variables in the caller's frame are preserved, right? If our main program has a variable i, and we call a function, and that function defines a variable i, it's gotta be a separate i. We don't want the main program modifying, the subprogram modifying the main program's variables. So there's a picture of the stack. And let's just suppose it's growing in this direction. And, and maybe here's the top of the stack. And we say call my print. Okay, so the return address gets saved on the stack. But the stack pointer is actually moved probably down to around here. And all of this stuff takes on local variables for this function that you're calling my print. So here's the top of the stack. If other calls are made, they'll get saved here and so on. But this function myprint, which has temporary variables and integer i and all that, those variables get stored in here. And the code that gets run when you start this function myprint knows that it needs this much space and it moves the stack pointer down. And when you say return, it reverses that operation. It moves the stack pointer back to here it says what's the address at the top of the stack. It pops that off and then it jumps to that location. That's how you get back to the caller. And now the stack is back to, you know, sitting right here. So this is sometimes called a call frame. And it's a chunk of memory that's temporarily set aside and used for information that the function needs while it's running. And when the function's done running, all that information is, is effectively lost, and that chunk of memory is available for other things to use. So when, when you do like an operating system course, you'll dig into this in detail. We touch on it a little bit in 270, but not, not in a lot of depth. And it's, it's very architecture dependent. Okay, it depends what kind of, of hardware you're running on and what language you're working in and so on and so forth. But there's some mechanism for setting aside space, usually on the stack, to store information. Okay? This is, this is essential for recursion to work. Because recursion, you have a function, uh, you know, traverse, calling itself traverse. Okay? Um, if traverse simply said, okay, I'm going to store i at location 10, I'm going to store j at location 20, then when I called myself recursively and I said i equals 0, 
location 10 would get changed to a zero. And when I come back to the caller and it says, what's the value of I at location 10, it's going to see a zero. Okay, so we need this, this temporary space. So I have a bunch of call frames here which we're going to use to look at how tree traversal works. And let's, let's pick a tree. So um, let's do F. Let's do frog and elephant and mouse and a gnat and a zebra and an ant and a cat. Alphabetical, I hope. Did I miss? Yeah. I'm ignoring uppercase, lowercase differences. So we're just alphabetizing. And we want to traverse this in left node right order. Okay. And so here's, here's the code we would use. If the root's null, just return. Otherwise, traverse the left subtree, print the root data, traverse the right subtree. Okay. And I'm going to keep track of my output over here. So this is what's actually being printed by your program. And we're going to start with page one, and this is called from main. So I called my traverse function with this tree. Okay, so this is what root looks like. It's, it's frog with all that stuff hanging off of it. All right, it's a four-line function. How hard can it be? So we call traverse. Here's root. Is the root null? So, so this is in progress. We're executing this statement. Is the root null? No. Okay, we're done with that statement. 25% done. Okay, next we start executing this statement, which says traverse root arrow left. All right, well, we need to make a call to a function. So we're going to start a new call frame. So this temporarily goes away. Here's call frame number two. It's called from uh, page one. Okay. And what are we passing to this? We're passing root arrow left. Does everybody see that's this tree down here? Okay. So in this call frame, traverse is being called with the following tree. Elephant, ant, cat. All right. This goes on the stack. It'll be there waiting for us when we return from this function, right? We're going to go back to call frame one, which is this one. Okay, so now it's a new day. We're just calling traverse on this, this weird looking tree. Okay, so start with the first instruction is the root null. No, we're done. Next instruction, traverse root arrow left. Well, that's this tree right here. Okay, we're going to make a call to this function traverse. So this is going to get saved on the stack. This is a new location in memory. We'll call it location three. It's called from location two, and the root looks like this. Okay, this goes on the stack. I'll put my stack over here. It's a LIFO. Okay, I'm never going to have to take anything from the middle of the stack. It's always going to come off the top. All right, so now we're calling traverse and um, check to see if the root's null. No, so we're done there. This was in progress, actually. Okay, um, traverse root arrow left. Okay, well, root arrow left is null. So we're going to make a new call. We're going to jump down here to page four. It's called from page three, and our root is null. Okay. We come into this call frame, we start executing this. Is root null? Yes, it is. We're going to return. Let me put my stack over there. Okay, it says return. Where do we return to? We return to wherever we were on page three. Okay, so we pop the stack. There's page three. Okay, we were traversing the left subtree. We're done with that. Now we print the root data, that's ant. So we've generated our first piece of output, ant. And we're done with that. 
Now we traverse the right subtree. The right subtree is just cat. So we make a new call frame. I'll call this page five. It's called from page three. And the tree we're passing looks like that. So this goes on the stack. And we say, is the root null? No. Let's traverse the left subtree. So we'll come down here and we'll call frame six from page three with the left subtree, which is null. We'll see if it's null. Yes, it is. It'll return. We're done with that traversal. Now we're going to print the root node, which is cat. We're done with that. We're going to traverse the right subtree. And I'll stop doing these in a minute, but you know, we'll call frame seven from three with null. We'll ask if it's null. Yes, it is. We'll return. We're done. We finished a call to traverse. Okay. What do we do? There's an implicit return here. Where do we return to? We return to call frame three. Okay, happens to be on the top of the stack. We just finished traversal of the right subtree. We're done. There's a return here. Where do we return to? We return to call frame two. That also happens to be on the top of the stack. What have we done? We just finished traversing the left subtree. Now it says print the root data. That's elephant. So we're done with that. Now it says traverse the right subtree, which is null. So we would make another call to frame eight. Call from page one to traverse null. See if the root's null. Yes, it is. We return. We're done traversing the right subtree. We say return. What have we done at this point? We've traversed this tree completely. And we printed out ant, cat, elephant. OK, where do we return to? We return to call frame one. In call frame one, we were in the middle of traversing root arrow left. We just finished that. Now we print the root data. That's frog. And now we have to traverse the right subtree, which is all of this. So I'll probably stop here unless you feel like we need to go on. But this is, you know, a new call frame called from one. And the root of the tree we're passing is this. And we'll do the same thing. This will make a series of recursive calls that will ultimately print out mat and then mouse and then zebra. And that's our whole traversal. And when that's done and it returns, we'll have finished our right traversal. We'll return from here back to our original caller, which was our main program. Yeah? So, um, I mean, this is kind of sidetracked, but I understand how recursions work, but I'm always curious, like, how do you, how does, like, mem in terms of, like, memory storage, like, how does calling a function that hasn't been fully defined as a function work? Like, how does uh, it doesn't have to be defined. So calling a function is really just jumping to a location, yeah. right? And and putting some information on your stack first, so that when you get back, things are as they were. Oh. Um, and you know, in this code, this is just saying jump to whatever address this function starts at, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and the CPU has no knowledge that it's jumping from inside this function. Yeah. Functions aren't even actually a thing when you get down to machine code in some sense. It's just lines of code. And sometimes you start executing lines of code over here. Um, and it might be a branch, or it might be a totally new function, or it might be the top of a while loop in your function. Yeah. Um, and it really makes no difference to the CPU. So it's not like an assembly where like go to is like specifically. Because I mean, like, I don't remember exactly how it works, but like, I know like certain statements where it's yeah, it's it's really like a go-to with a push beforehand. So it pushes the return address and then it says go to, you know, whatever address this function starts at. That's what a call is, basically. It's, it's more than a little weird. And you can do recursion without actually making calls. I mean, you could make a loop that does recursion and just you know, sort of save your local variables somewhere, add them to a list or something, and then pull them off when you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that, that helps explain it. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bizarre. 
All right, does that help a little bit with traversal? Sort of how that's actually playing out? And it's, it's nice, to, it's useful to think about it like this sometimes, but like I say, when we're actually writing the code, it's probably most useful to not think about this, right? To not get too tangled up in how is this going to work because it, it's, the, the thing that makes recursion uh, useful and, and powerful and ultimately simpler way to program is that we don't think about all these things that are going on. We just leave it to the, the computer to figure out for us. Um, but it's a faith thing, right? If I have absolute faith that this will do the right thing, that this will correctly traverse a tree, then this will absolutely correctly traverse a tree. Right? So you got to believe in this first before you can believe in it, basically. <laughs> but if you just make that leap and say, I'm going to believe that this works, then you can say, oh, yeah, well, obviously this does work. What if it doesn't work, and then you don't know how to say, correct it? You mean practically speaking, like you program it and it's not working? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so there's the algorithm and there's the implementation, right? So um, the algorithm is either sound or not sound, right? And the algorithm for LNR traversal is is presumably you know sound because I've I've given it to you and you can trust me. Um, but but the implementation is where lots of things can go wrong. Um, GDB is a little bit painful when you get to recursion, right? Because you're not going to know easily where you are. <laughs> in your recursive calls, right? You're, you're single stepping and it's, it's, you know, down here and it's like, I don't know where I am. Um, but it can be somewhat useful, right? GDB, you can always look at the arguments that you were passed and tell something from that. Printf's will still work. Um, printf's with global variables will work sometimes. So you can have a global variable that basically keeps track of how deep you are in the recursion. And every time you start your function, increment it. Every time you return, decrement it. And now if you print out the value of that global next to your usual printf statements, like about to call this or about to call that, that can sometimes help you know kind of how far down you are. Or if you see that variable getting up into the millions, you know that you're not returning somewhere where you should. Um, but I don't have a, a single solution. Um, but working with the code, trying to understand where it is that it's going to the calls, that'll all help with understanding recursion. So it's another case where having bugs is actually like beneficial. Do insertion. Let's start with an empty tree. And let's insert a ten into our empty tree. All right, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to say, is root equal to null? Yes, it is. So I'm going to um, set temp equal to malloc, right? I'm going to set is data equal to our number. I'm going to set left and right equal to null. So temp is going to look like a 10 with no children, right? The children are going to be null. And I'm going to return temp. And that's it. This call is done. And the return from this insert is a tree containing a single node, which is the root. So at this point in my main program, if I had said something like root equals null, and then root equals insert, root comma 10, now root is this tree with just a 10 in it. OK, 
Okay, so now our main program is going to say insert root comma 20. And our root looks like this. And our number we're inserting is 20. And here's, let's call it page 2. Okay, so what does the insert function do? It starts off and it says, is root equal to null? No, it's not. So this doesn't execute at all. Okay, if our number is bigger than root arrow data, which it is. Okay, so we're going to execute this statement. Temp equals insert root right comma num. Okay, root arrow right is null. So we're going to insert a 20 into a null tree. So we're making a call from page 2. We're inserting a 20 into a null tree. And again, it'll say is root equal to null. Yes, it is. So it'll malloc a new node. Set the data value equal to 20. Left and right children are null. And it'll return. So this call to insert will return a tree containing just a 20. Okay, we were called from page 2. So we go back to page 2. We're returning this tree containing just a 20. And this instruction that caused us to call said temp equals whatever the result of that insert is. Well, insert returned a tree containing just a 20, so we set temp equal to that, so this is what temp looks like. And now we say root arrow right equals temp. Well, this is root, so on the right child, we set a 20. And now we return. This is a typo. This should return root. So we return root. And our main program sees this as its result. So now in our main program, if we said root equals insert root comma 20, when we get back, root looks like this. And let's do one more. Let's insert a 15 into root. All right, so we're going to make a call to another page. We'll call page four. This was called from page two. The root that we were passed was a tree that looks like this. The number we're inserting is 15. All right, so is root equal to null? No. If number is bigger than root arrow data, well, root arrow data is 10, 15 is bigger than root arrow data. So we're going to say insert root arrow right comma num. So we're executing this statement. Root arrow right is this node containing a 20. So we're going to make a new call. This is going to be page five. It's called from page four. The root of the tree looks like this and we're inserting a 15. All right, is root null? No. Um, is our number bigger than root arrow data? No. Is our number less, so our number is less than root arrow data. So we're going to execute this instruction. This says insert root arrow left, comma, num. Okay, root arrow left is null. We're going to make a new call to insert. So this is going to be call frame six. Call from page five, root is null. The number we're inserting is... Um, 15 and we'll say is root null yes it is so malloc some space set the data equal to the number no left and right children return this node all right so this call to insert returns a 15 we set temp equal to that so temp looks like 15 and now we say root arrow left equals temp so we put the 15 right there and now we return the root. Where do we return to? We return to page four. And we're returning this. And page four says root arrow right equals whatever we got back from insert. Okay, insert return this tree. And so we set temp equal to that. Root arrow right equals temp. Well, this is root, so we change 
its right child to be a 20 and a 15. And this is done and we return this root and we return that to page two, which was our main program. So root is the result of our insert. So now root is 10, 20, 15. Right? And so we've inserted a 15 into that old tree. All right, so let's delete. So here's page one. This is called from Maine. And our tree looks like 20, 10, uh, 15, Let's delete the number 10 from this tree. And these are all return root. All right, what does delete do? First thing it does, it checks to see if root data is equal to num, which it's not. So we're not going to execute this instruction. Now we're going to say, is our number less than root data? And it is. So we're going to execute this set of statements. So first thing we're going to do is call delete on the left subtree and try to delete a 10 from it. Okay, this makes a new call frame, a new instance of delete. This is page two, it's called from page one, and we're trying to delete from the left subtree. So the root looks like this, 10, 7, 6, 8, 9, 15, and we want to delete 10. All right, first thing to check, is the root data equal to the number we want? Yes, it is. So we're trying to delete the root. There's no recursion involved here. This is all the stuff we talked about yesterday. So we move to the left. We find the biggest node in this tree by moving as far to the right as possible. And once we find that, we replace the root with this value. If there was anything on the left of 9, 8 would pick it up on the right. So this is the way that the tree looks after we do stuff. Okay, and I've skipped all that code in here. And we're going to return the root of this tree. So we go back to where we came from, which was page 1. And we said temp equal to the result of this deletion. So temp looks like this, 9, 7, 6, 8, 15. Okay, that's temp. Now we say root arrow left equals temp. Well, our root is the node 20, and we change its left child to be temp. So it's a 9, 7, 6, 8, and a 15. And then we return root. That's the tree we return to our caller, which was main. And this is the tree you should get when you delete 10 from this tree, right? So we did stuff in here to remove the root, replace it with a 9, but then that just replaces what was to the left of 20. And if we had called down, you know, 15 levels in the tree to get to this point, Everything above there would look exactly the same, right? The thing that called this would have its left child or right child be exactly what it was before. It's just that this 10 got replaced with a 9, and that 9 disappeared from there. So that's the way the recursion kind of feels if you actually play it out.
right, so let's talk about doing stuff. Let's write some code for deleting the root of a tree. So, um, if the left child of the root is null, that's the one case where we get to move the root, and we just say root equals root right. And we need to free the old root. And then we return the new root. So that's, that's the edge case where there's nothing to the left of the root, so we can't find the largest node in the left subtree. Um, otherwise, we can do something like left subtree equals root arrow left. The left subtree has nothing on its right. This is a case where where our tree looks like this. We're deleting the root. Here's the root of the left subtree, and we'd like to find the largest thing in that node in that tree. The largest thing is the root. Okay. So we want to replace the root with this node, right? So we're really just building a link like that, and then free the root. So in this one particular case, we can do the following. Left subtree right equals root right. Free the root and then return uh, left subtree. So this is ls left subtree. Have its right child be whatever the root's right child was. Free the root and then return this as the new root. So that's another edge case. The alternative is there's nodes going off to the right and maybe other stuff as well. So now we need to do a pair of pointers. Okay, so general case. So prior equals left subtree, current equals left subtree right. So this is prior and this is current. And I would loop while there's something to the right. So while there's still something more to the right of current, move down the tree. So prior equals current, current equals current right. So move down, here's prior, here's current. There's still something to the right of current, so move down, here's prior, here's current. Now at this point, current right is null, so we're done. We don't want to move any further. And we found the two nodes that we were talking about yesterday. Current is the largest node in the left subtree, and prior is the node immediately above it. It's its parent. And once we have those, now we just piece everything together. So this was, this was the code that we, we put together as a group yesterday. So um, prior right equals current left. So that adopts current's left child. And then current left can be changed to be root left. Current right can take whatever root had on the right. So those two statements effectively move this node current to be the new root, right? Because it adopts the left and right children of the old root. And then free the old root. 
and then return the new root, which is current. Okay, that's an example. Don't go home and stare at the code and try to make sense out of it. Try to recreate the code, okay? Chances are it'll come out looking pretty similar. But understand the steps, right? If there's nothing to the left, move the root down. If there's a left subtree but there's nothing to the right of that root node, just make this left subtree's root the new root of the tree. And since it has nothing on the right, pick up the root's old right subtree to be the new root's right subtree. That's what's going on here. Otherwise, start at the root. There's at least one node to the right, prior current, prior current, prior current. Walk down all the way until current is the rightmost node, prior is the node right before it. And then do those steps that we talked about yesterday. Have prior adopt current's left child. Have current pick up the left and right subtree of the root as its own children. Free the root, return current as the new root. There's your whole dilution. And it's wonderful once you get this to work. It's something else before then. <laughs> but you can get lots of interesting errors. You can get infinite loops. You can get uh, seg faults. You can get um, you know, traversals that go on forever. Um, but here, you, know, you can go through the delete algorithm in GDB. There's nothing recursive in here. So this one's easier to debug in some ways. Go through and after each of these, examine your tree in memory, right, inside GDB, print root arrow left, arrow right, or whatever, and, and see what your tree looks like after you do each of these. Make sure it looks the way it's supposed to. Right, each of these is doing one thing, and so if you see that one change, you're probably good. All right, so tomorrow is an open lab, so I will be here... Um, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. I'm not going to lecture on anything. Come in with your um, programs and work on them if you want. I'll be here to answer questions, help you out however I can. Um, or if you don't have any work to do, you can take the day off from class. All right, so I'll see you tomorrow.